Hi everyone, I'm your host, Arlen Schumer, and welcome to one of my pop culture presentations. Get ready to be both educated and entertained, what I call edutainment. And when you're done, please be sure to click the subscribe or follow button on your platform screen to be notified of all of my upcoming pop culture presentations. Summer of 1966, the height of Batmania. Were you there? I was there. I was eight years old. But folks, how did we get from here in 1966 to here in 20, 2022 and the incredible success of the Batman film with Robert Pattinson? But there would be no Batman film in 2022 if it wasn't for what this artist did in 1972. In 1973, his version of the Joker is what's responsible for any of the live action cinematic Jokers of the last three decades. In fact, there would be no Dark Knight or Dark Knight graphic novel by Frank Miller, who studied at Neil's feet, probably influenced by beautiful images like that, yeah, there'd be no Batman Begins or any of the most recent films if it wasn't for what this artist did in one issue in 1968. By eschewing this Batman and going back to Batman's roots, he gave us this Batman. He's the greatest artist Batman artist of all time. His name, of course, is Neil Adams. He passed away a couple of weeks ago at the age of 80. And I'm proud to be delivering these memorial webinars, seven of them, uh, concluding on June 15th, what would have been his 81st birthday. This is actually part two of my Batman webinar last night. There was just too much to include. So part one ended at the end of 1970. Part two begins dated January 71. Now comic books are dated three or four months in advance to encourage retailers to keep them on the newsstands. But uh, so technically this issue went on sale in late fall of 1970. It was the third of Neil Adams' Batman Man Bat clashes. The first one was earlier that spring of 1970. Great cover. I covered these last night, of course, in Batman Part One. One of my all time favorite covers, the second Man Bat appearance. And a couple months later, we get this one. The Bride of the Man Bad, kind of like Frankenstein with, you know, Bride of Frankenstein. But yeah, it turns out, of course, that Kirk Langstrom's wife injected his bat serum and became a female Man Bat. Now, this is, of course, the original Man Bat. And that's a pretty intense layout. I like, I like the kind of X shape of the panel borders there and a pretty intense man bat. As we get to the end of the story, you can see here, what have I accomplished except saving myself, says Batman. And then before his awe-filled eyes, the transformation back to Kirk Langstrom and with his wife, Francine. 
And that would be actually Neil Adams' last Batman, a man bat illustrated story. He would do one more cover a year later in 1972, but the co-creator of Man Bat, the writer Frank Robbins, would illustrate that story. A couple of years later, in the mid-70s, Neil and his studio continuity would do a series of books and record um, packages for Power Records or Peter Pan Records. Um, I'll be showing more of these towards the end of tonight's webinar, but this came with a uh, multiple page illustrated comic that Neil and his studio turned out. And there's another version of Man Bat. In Neil's absence though, DC Comics, which owned the character, would keep the character alive. This is Jim Aparo, circa 1976, I believe. And then of course, in 1992, the great Batman animated series, the very first episode, in fact, on Leather Wings was their version of Man Bat. They got Kevin Nolan, one of the great modern illustrators, to design the Man Bat, as you can see in these rough sketches. And in the storyboards, you can see that, you know, they stayed faithful to Neil's original flying designs because Neil actually studied the way bats flew. And that's why his man bat, like everything else he drew, was so realistically accurate. In the recent decades, man bat, every now and then, comes up with his own series. This is the most recent. You can tell by the change in the DC logo. But yeah, it all goes back to 52 years ago with the very first man bat, one of Neil's greatest covers. So that was issue 400. The last Man Bat was 407. The very next issue of Detective Comics, we would be greeted with this incredible image. Robin, what's happening to you? Robin turning to dust? What a cover. You know, one of the taboos they say of comic book covers is not to have broken up panels, like in a comic book page on the cover, have a single image. But uh, Neil didn't care. It made for one of his most memorable covers. The story is an oddity, even for Batman. You can see that there's a cinematic flavor to Neil's work because of his realism. When you just look at these opening panels, you already get a cinematic sense that you're in a film with Neil Adams, the director. And when you turn the page, I'm trying to use this Apple Kino program to build for you, the viewers of this webinar, a more dynamic way of viewing the comic art in the way I think the artist wanted you to kind of register it. You see the top panels first and then you get to the bottom panel, even though of course you see the whole page at once. I'll be doing this technique throughout the webinar. It's one of the few times that Neil literally copied the cover as the splash page. But as the story continues, it's kind of a haunted house story. Batman is chasing what he believes to be Robin. And it's another example. I talked about it last night in part one, but Neil's ability to combine realism with stylization, there's just as much stylization and pure cartooning in this close-up of a maniacal Robin, as there is the realism of the gun itself. And it's that combination that makes Neil one of the Hall of Fame greats. So in a kind of a very Twilight Zone-y, dreamlike fashion, things keep happening to Batman. Beautiful panel with the matches. Batman comes upon a funeral, and of course, it's his body in the casket. And then Neil gives us a nice little murderer's row of DC Comics characters. We get the chance to see a close-up of Superman, very rare for Neil Adams to do Superman in a Batman story, of course. And there's his take on Robin. 
you turn the page here, and all of a sudden, even Batman himself is saying, this was ridiculous. It's like an old time movie serial. But you're captivated by Neil's artistry. You really feel like you're in this haunted house with Batman. What's going to happen? The pacing of Neil Adams to make you turn the page. And then what the? All of a sudden, we jump cut to this very high tech sci-fi kind of thing where Batman and Robin are in these pneumatic tubes being blown up and down in the air. What the? Dr. Sinson, the master of illusion. Ah, look at the editor's note. He was introduced in Detective Comics 354. Why, that's during the pre-TV show. Actually, this is 1966, the year of the TV show, with a great Carmen Infantino, Joe Jella cover. But this introduced Sinson. So technically, Sinson is the first of the old Batman villains to be reintroduced into the new Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill and other writers kind of universe of, of the early 1970s. Nice penultimate page, but I'm showing it to you because you know if you saw last night's webinar, I love, well, I don't love it, but I kind of dig Neil's modern Batmobile. He introduced it a year before Man Bat. And, you know, I talked about how when Neil came on the scene as a steady Batman artist a year before 1969, part of what they did editorially with Batman was remove him from Bat the Bat Cave and from all the Bat paraphernalia of the TV show, Robin, Alfred, the Batmobile. But Neil liked that car. Anyway, speaking of covers, in our chronology, March of 1971, we get this cover. And why am I showing you this cover when Neil didn't draw the interior story? Because here's the original black and white art for it. Batman was meant to be in the skies above these black, you know, motorcycle militants, obviously. And here is a very recent colored version that was done, I think, with Neil's cooperation or permission. So think about it, folks. This is the way Neil intended it. And the powers that be at DC had it altered to kind of, I think, defang or, de or you know, take away some of the intensity. Remember, this is 1971. The Black Panthers were being prosecuted in courts. Uh, it was still touchy for them to do this. So it's interesting that a more recent European version of the cover made it with a red sky. So the next issue of Detective Comics, two issues later, spring of 1971, dated April, issue 410. What's this story about? A, a, a kid with flippers being held from a belfry? What the? Well, first we get this amazing splash page. And I always like saying splash page if it has anything to do with water. But yeah, pun unintended in this case. I've always thought that this cover had to have influenced a young Frank Miller growing up in Vermont, probably about 11 years old or so at the time of this. This is the original art recently put up for auction of the famous cover for the famous graphic novel of 1986, The Dark Knight Returns, which is really the debut of the post Neil Adams modern Batman. We've been living with Miller's Dark Knight for the last, how many years now? Uh, 34 years, 36 years, I'm sorry, 36 years. But yeah, I see a lot of influence. And of course, Miller studied with Neil at Continuity and is one of Neil's many artistic children, so to speak. How about this page and that great leaping Batman figure? Here is Neil's thumbnail sketch. 
This is one quarter of the size of an eight and a half by 11 piece of type uh, Xerox paper. So this is one quarter, you know, and that's how big Neil drew these pages in sketch form. Unfortunately, no record was kept of his amazing type pencils and barely any of his inks. All that exists are the printed pages to show you how close Neil's sketches were to them. I love this figure so much that I took its sketch and I used it for this double page spread of an article interview I did with Neil in the year 1999 for this now defunct trade magazine, Comic Book Marketplace. And they got Neil to do a brand new cover. And here's another one of my double page spreads with one of Neil's great thumbnail sketches blown up and um, integrated with the type there. But back to that issue, here we have a nice page of Batman running towards the bell tower. And I wanted to show you this page because it's just another example in the left panel of how Neil spent a lot of time making Batman's cape part of his mystique in the different ways that it would drape and billow. <coughs> Bat <coughs> Batman climbs up the bell tower. Again, Neil knew how that cape would billow and all the scalloped edges. And then here he confronts the bad guy with Denny O'Neill's dialogue. You'll kill him anyway, says Batman in the bottom right panel. Maybe so, maybe no. You do as I ask, you'll at least buy him another minute. How about this great close-up of Neil? I heard lots about you. Some say you're a crook, like that guy you chase. Others hold that you're practically a saint. Which is it? Neither, but I can't let you destroy an innocent bystander, not while I'm alive. I'll do as you demand, but I swear you won't get away with it. Call it a vow from the grave. Notice Batman has slipped his rope so that it would circle around the beam sticking out, but he does jump off. And how about this incredible close-up? of the disabled child with the bad guy. And this thumbnail sketch, again, maybe this is three inches wide in its original form, but look at how much of Neil's artistry ends up in the finished, tightly penciled and inked work. And then we get this incredible sequence. You've seen it? You come near letting on what you've seen, you, so you got to die too. Goodbye, boy. I hope it don't hurt. Now we can see Batman hanging out down below. But look at the way Neil Adams designs this page. Now, folks, just the design of this page, the breakup of space and time, you could teach an entire class just on the dynamics and the design and composition of this incredible page. And how about its incredible thumbnail? Again, a quarter of the size of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And look how much of it is in there. Again, folks, the combination of realism and stylization, the motion lines, look at all of the line work of motion lines on the right center of the page in the large panel above the kid and his right arm. All of that is pure cartooning in order to make all of this motion work. The torque of Batman's body in panel two, the middle left, how you can feel the weight of the kid resting on Batman's arm. And again, knowing those motion lines to put in is the art of cartooning. And this is just one of Neil's all time greatest pages and pieces of Batman art. So we get the conclusion and 
This is a regular, regular page. I'm really only showing it to you to bring closure, but to show you this beautiful panel. And if that feels like the final panel of a film, it's Neil totally paying homage to this famous scene from Ingmar Berman's most famous movie, I believe, The Seventh Seal with the chess match with the devil. How about this for a startling cover image? Batman looking on as Robin gets shot, but in the background, ghostly, is this weird character in another beautiful mezzotint. I'm using a printer's term for the type of screen work that Neil did on this cover. Once again, there's the thumbnail a quarter of the size of an eight and a half by 11 page. Notice when Neil does bring things to finish, he moves parts of it around. So, you know, because you got to allow for all the trade dress and logo elements. As we open up the cover, another very cinematic, again, when people talk about film on paper, it's not just the breaking up of panels to look like film frames but it's the way you tell a story. Neil in another life was the level of Spielberg or Stanley Kubrick or any of the great masters of Orson Welles in the way he paces and acts as his own cinematographer. Just this splash is so admired that it was used in a very prestigious international art magazine in 1972 as you know, one of the pieces to print in color about Neil's work. It was the magazine Graphis. I think it comes out of, you know, I'm not sure, maybe it comes out of Switzerland, Graphis. But this is from 1972. But there is the introduction of Reish Al Ghul. I think I pronounced it originally Reish Al Ghul. But I think in the intervening years, as we become more Muslim aware, it's Raish, I believe. And if you know your Batman of recent vintage, you know that he's been turned into a live action villain played by Liam Neeson and in the great Batman animated series as well. But for me, the highlight of Raish's initial appearance is the plane ride that they take to Asia and we get to see Neil's first all black bat cowl, which I must have stared at for hours when it first came out. It harkened back to Bob Kane's, one of his very first Batman images from 1940, talking about Batman's origin, which Neil gets to redo in his own way in this particular issue. There are the kind of stations of the back cross, so to speak, if you know your Batman origin. And I love the fact that Neil chose to model his Batman drawing based on the Bob Kane original. But if you know your Bob Kane, you know nothing he did was original. He took this figure from Hal Foster's Tarzan, you know, a decade earlier. But I digress. Back to the Ra's al Ghul story. So where, I forget where we are here. Uh, maybe we're in, uh, you know, where was Casablanca again? Something like that. And the reason why I'm showing you these two panels is because I happen to have the thumbnail sketches for both of them integrated into my Neil interview article that I showed you earlier. And once again, these are, like I said, a quarter of the size of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. But you can see how accurate they are to the finished art. Here's one of Neil's great Batman close-ups. Again, he showed you as much of the man in Batman as he showed you the bat in Batman. So here we get another great all black cowl, you turn the page. And here's just a great example of Neil's realism 
with cartooning. You feel the punch because of Neil's knowledge of physics and action, anatomy. You feel the punch on the right panel. And then, of course, the storytelling. When you turn the page, you get the widescreen final punch, the beautiful stylized cape, and just a magnificent action panel. And then Neil tops it off with just this beautiful vignette in high contrast shadow of Batman and a very boyish looking Robin. You know, I never liked Robin. I think Batman jumped the shark when Robin was introduced. Most of Neil's Batman stories are solo without Robin. But, you know, he does have a few appearances with Robin and he must have loved it. So that's why he did it. Now we get to the reappearance of another of Batman's classic villains who hadn't been in the comics, I think for decades, when he was reintroduced in the early summer of 1971. But in addition to the color hold, as they're called, the magenta on the cover, separating itself from the line art of the rest of the cover, I think somebody on Facebook, an artist, a current comic artist who was influenced like everybody was by Neil, wrote, he waxed poetic over just the draping of Batman's cape on this cover and how you can feel the weight of the cape and how it would pull down from Batman's figure. And this is the type of inspiration that Neil's incredible art provided for people. Better than the covers, the splash page, again, one of Neil's greatest. You know, you can have a great drawing of Batman from behind, just as great as drawing Batman from the front, if you understand how drapery folds. Of course, the cape is impossibly long, and yet it's realistically drawn. That's the magic of Neil. And then, of course, you've got the background. Another mezzotint printer's term for the type of drawing that Neil would do in looks like grease pencil, maybe, um, some of that shading, and then would get a halftone Velox, as they're called, and give it to the printer on a separate layer from the black and white line art. Bottom line is you get a finished masterpiece that looks like this. And folks, this is pre-computer. This is old Benday dot newsprint, but I wouldn't have it any other way. So from the very gothic and stylized, Neil can do very plain quality, simple storytelling, but that packs a punch. I keep coming back to Spielberg because that's really what Spielberg is. He's like the Neil Adams of cinema, that he would give you moments like this for comedic relief. And again, I'm enlarging this to show you how great Neil's thumbnail sketches were that I also used in my article interview with him and how much of the gesture full of life these thumbnails are. Again, quarter the size of an eight and a half by 11 page. Now this page, I happen to be able to show you it, its entirety of its creation. There's the ink version. Neil's soulmate inker partner, Dick Giordano, did the inks. And then there's Neil's thumbnail, a quarter of the size of the printed page. So the only thing we're missing, of course, is the tight pencil because Giordano, nobody back then thought to take Xeroxes if they even had access to a Xerox machine in 1971. I know Jack Kirby did on the West Coast, but not for Neil. One of my favorite Neil faces in thumbnail form, here's a better resolution version of it in my article. But here's a case, and Neil talks about this in my Neil Adams sketchbook that I did with him, how I think it, he lost something by the time he brought it to finish. While some might think this is one of the great Batman faces, and it still kind of is, there's something about it I don't like compared to 
what I do like about Neil's thumbnail. Well, there's the villain of the piece, Two-Face, and Neil gets to retell his origin as well. But there's a beautiful classic close-up by Neil Adams and Dick Giordano. Now, almost 20 years later, Neil would do a Batman cover dated 1990 there, an annual of Batman, and give us his more modern take on Two-Face. But man, I'll take the 1971 original. And I told you how much I kind of dig Neil's Batmobile. In many ways, the Pattinson version, I think, is more based on this than any other. But here's a great action page of Batman and by Neil. I love the bat symbol on the hood of the car. And once again, that no weird diagonal panels, very straightforward. He knew the Batman audience was skewed younger than his older Marvel or DC audience for his other titles like Green Lantern, Green Arrow, which we're going to talk about next week. But his Batman stories are simply designed. It's really what's going on inside the panels and in incredible emotional drawings like this. So many artists were influenced by drawings like this. I mean, all that energy and emotion just in Batman's hand conveys so much life. But the knowledge of the tendons in the hand, the muscles, the knuckles, and then, of course, Batman's mouth and facial contortions, that's Neil's mastery of anatomy. So I was buying Justice League of America at the time, November of 1971, because Neil was doing the covers. The interiors were drawn by Dick Dillon, another DC journeyman. But you had a love whenever Neil not only drew the Justice League, but of course included Batman on the cover. Little did we know that he would draw four pages of the interior story. And I'm highlighting my favorite page because of these two beautiful drawings of Batman. And that's Neil inking himself. That's not Dick Giordano. And that's why... The fine lines on the right-hand side or on Batman's face are really just gorgeous. Ah, but the next cover he would do and the next interior story, though it's dated December of 71, it came out in late September, early October, just in time for Halloween. Now, if that cover doesn't grab you, and boy, did it grab us, how about this splash page? Again, it's one of Neil's greatest. It's another gothic Batman. And it's another piece of cinematic comic art. And I just mean that while it's a beautiful piece of two-dimensional flat art, beautifully designed, beautifully drawn and inked and everything composed, it also feels like the opening frame of an incredible horror film that happens to have Batman in it. Maybe they should make a Batman horror film, I don't know. But this particular story happens to take place in Rutland, Vermont, which at the time had been hosting a Batman costume character Halloween parade. This was before the age of comic conventions. Yeah, there were a few in New York, nothing really out on the West Coast, but all during the 60s, this particular guy, Tom Fagan, shown here in one of the few photographs that exist, was a big Batman fan. And he would dress up as Batman. And this was cosplay in the 1960s before it was even called cosplay. Now, I should have shown this image again. Those characters walking with Dick Grayson are based on real life comic book artists and writers that Neil and Denny O'Neill, the writer of the story, knew and hung out with. So in the right panel, on the far right, that's Alan Weiss. Then you've got Dick Grayson. In the back behind him is the writer, Jerry Conway. And the guy in the black boots with the glasses is the great, late Bernie Wrightson. 
And there's a whole story to this particular comic book story, which was based on an incident that happened to Bernie and the guys in the 1970 Halloween Rutland Parade and Hangout. So in this particular story, Neil draws Tom Fagan. And then you have this great panel of Neil drawing. That's Denny O'Neill in the center with the black hat. And that's Marv Wolfman as Abel from House of Mystery. And here they are. And again, one of the few photographs I can scarf up. That's Marv Wolfman in the center as Aquaman. And Len Wein on the left as Morbius, who they just made a movie of. Uh, Len Wein passed away a few years ago. Marv Wolfman is still alive and kicking and doing well in Hollywood. Both of those guys, I forgot to mention, they wrote that Dr. Simpson story. But here they are immortalized in Neil's 1971 Batman story written by Denny O'Neill that basically recalls the incidents that happened to them the year before in the 1970 parade. And there's a nice close-up of Bernie Wrightson. Here's one of the few photographs I could find, very low resolution. And how about this self-portrait that Bernie did at about that time? And you can see that Neil's drawing is not that far from reality. But the story really kicks into high gear as we follow Robin going through the dark Vermont woods. And he comes upon a darn familiar figure. Batman, is that you? And then we get this incredible scene. Oh, dear Lord, he's dead. Wait, this poor guy's been murdered, but he's not the Batman. The costume is cheap, shoddy. He must have been rented. He's one of the party goers. The moonlight's so dim, I can't read the ground for footprints. We may have to wait till morning for clues. Now, if you look at the way Neil has designed this page so far, you will notice... In the upper right corner, what looks like black clad feet of somebody in a maybe a purple robe. Ah, but then we get to the bottom two panels and there is Neil's mastery of human emotion along with the right cartooning speed lines and shock lines on the right panel to make you feel Robin's utter shock. Why is he shocked? Because you turn the page and you see this. Now, once again, this image works on so many levels, from pure drawing to pure drama, to the intensity of this villainous, scythe-wielding, Grim Reaper skull character. Again, one of the few times Neil would reprise his cover onto a full page image. Ah, but then we get the introduction of Batman, the Batman, the dread Batman. A beautiful drawing on the left. And just, you know, it's hard to relate this, but, you know, if you were there like I was as a Batman fan, we, we drank up every single panel that Neil drew because every drawing of Batman was some kind of revelation of how cool Batman could look. So when you get to the bottom where Batman brings Robin back to the mansion, how about this very Citizen Kane-like panel? Now, Neil didn't have to take the time to draw Batman's multiple reflections, but he did. And that's what makes this simple panel a beauty. And then you get another one of Neil's great close-ups. I'm sure he had photo reference for this. And this looks like a story Neil did not color himself because I think had Neil colored this, we would have gotten much more stylized lighting on the close-up versus just a hunk of flesh with just a little white rim lighting. But alas, you know, Neil was only human, couldn't do everything. Once again, we get an incredible drawing of Batman's hands alone, but you can feel the way he's inching himself up 
to get to the bad guy with the gun, even though there's no motion, there's no, remember, as Robert Crumb would say, folks, it's just lines on paper, but what lines they are. And how about this storytelling? When Batman switches the light off and then has a fight interspersed with black panels, and then you get the release, tension and release, as art critics say, of the final panel. And then there's this masterpiece that I'm choosing to show you this way, a full page image. And that's film on paper, folks. That's one of Neil's greatest cinematic breakdowns where you can feel that, you can see it in your mind. It's only a two dimensional drawing folks, but man, is that alive? And then the final confrontation with the bad guy, of course, it's the doctor, but he was a Holocaust survivor. What the? Now, in addition to that being an incredible Neil drawing, the last time in comic books that the Holocaust was presented so forcefully from this panel in 1971, you'd have to go back over 15 years earlier to EC Comics, circa 1955, 54, one of its last stories illustrated by the great Bernard Krigstein, all about a Holocaust survivor who sees his former commandant on the subway. And he has flashbacks to when he was in the camps. Now, folks, in 1954, or 55, nobody was doing comic book stories about the Holocaust and basing it on the images that finally made it out after the war of the horrors of the camps. But you can see how Neil incorporated that into this groundbreaking Batman story about a villain that was a victim of Nazi Germany. Now, these are two thumbnail pages, left and right. The bottom half of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper of the final two pages of this incredible story. So look on the left side of the page and how there's the finished art. And now the right side of the page, I'm giving you folks enough time to really get a sense of what's going on here. And then you get this. You know, the addition of the Jewish star. I mean, neither Neil Adams nor Denny O'Neill are Jewish, but Alan Weiss, the character that that is at his, you know, death's door on the left page is Jewish. And that's what gives this story and the sequence the resonance. So I would say about 30 years later, uh, in the early 2000s, this is a photograph of Neil at a Wizard World convention with Raphael Madoff, who's the head of the Institute for Holocaust Studies in Washington, D.C. And he worked with Neil on a project that was dear to Neil's heart about the real life story of a woman named Dina Babbitt. Her real name was Gottliebova. But she was a young artist growing up in Czechoslovakia. She was Jewish. And of course, she was deported by the Nazis to Terra Seinstein. Terra Seinstein was a Nazi transit camp, very infamous as they all were. But this is Neil's art, I would say circa 2005 or six, maybe. And it's some of his heartfelt, most heartfelt work. As we get into the story, she gets transferred to Auschwitz, where a mural that she paints for the children meets her up with, yes, Mengele himself, who basically forcibly, she thinks she's, he's going to murder her or experiment on her. But no, he wants her to paint portraits of the gypsy internees in the camps because Mengele feels photographs don't do the skin tones justice. 
in order to show that they're an inferior race. He wants them to be painted with what he feels are their true, inferior, darker skin tones. But as you can follow along in this horrific story, she's forced to paint a human heart. And those are some of the actual portraits she did up until January 1945. What's amazing about Dina Babbitt's story is that she winds up in America. She survives the camps and winds up as an animator for Disney. No, wait, animated for Jay Ward Productions, Warner Brothers and MGM. Fascinating story. And then what brought the story to Madoff's and Neil's attention was when she tried to reclaim her paintings from the Auschwitz Museum and they would refuse to give them back to her. Well, this is an incredible story. I urge you all to just research it and read it for yourself. But it just shows you how much Neil was committed to, you know, retelling the story of the Holocaust. He was what we Jews call a righteous Gentile. Look at this project he did after the Bebit thing, also with Madoff, a motion comic based on this book, American Voices Against the Holocaust. So these are the best register quality images I could find. They... I tried to find one of the motion comics online, but I couldn't. But needless to say, you know, in Neil's last, you know, two decades of his life, he churned out, I shouldn't say churned, he put out some incredible artwork that just is some of, I think, his best work in his late career. Now, if you look at this lineup of characters, Neil always did a great lineup of characters. How about this thumbnail sketch for a wraparound cover, meaning the front and the back cover of what looks like Batman with a whole bunch of DC Comics characters. That looks like Plastic Man and the Chief from the Doom Patrol. Ah, here is the best resolution I can find of Neil's inked work, or maybe Giordano, I think, inked this. But you can see it much better in its final full color printed version and again you know we bought these just for the great neil covers and speaking of neil covers as we continue chronologically we're in 1972 now here is the half page house ad that dc comics put for this particular cover at dawn dies mary mcguffin now neil did not draw the interior but man, was this cover captivating. And what if I told you, yes, it started out as a convention sketch, I believe, that Neil did with felt tip marker from, you know, 1971, maybe 72, maybe 70. I don't know. I've never been able to find confirmation. But Bernie Wrightson loved this image so much that somehow they talked Julia Schwartz into Neil penciling this as a cover, but we don't have a record of the pencil. But there is Bernie Wrightson's beautiful inks. And of course, how it looked as the finished cover. Interesting color scheme for the background. Maybe Neil colored it, maybe he didn't. But this image has become iconic ever since. Uh, this is like an 11 by 14 uh, three-dimensional uh, kind of a diorama image behind glass hanging up in my living room right here. But there is it in the original packaging. How about a shoji screen? That's the front and back. That's about six feet tall by four feet or three feet wide. And I have it displaying, of course, the MacGuffin side. This is a recent image off the internet. They made it into, there's not a lot of Neil Adams merchandise. He came of age at a time after the TV show that there was not a lot of Batman merchandise. Most of this stuff has been produced recently, like this manly piece. Yes, you can now wear this weird black and white version. But speaking of weird black and white versions, our next chronological Batman story by Neil 
starts off with this thumbnail sketch, a quarter of the size of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Just imagine that in your minds, folks, as it becomes the finished penciled, inked, and colored and published piece. This was the splash page to Neil's cover. A lot of people love this cover. It's not one of my favorite, but I understand why people love it. Great action piece. This is a figure that Neil would return to decades later for commissioned full color painted pieces that look like this. But how about this beautiful thumbnail sketch of a Batman head? Again, folks, maybe that's, you know, one, one inches by two inches. But look at how it made it into the final page. Batman skiing by Neil Adams. Yes. That's the only time he drew him skiing. But you got to love that profile view, huh? And then here's another what I call the sensitive side of Neil. The top left panel, you can feel the winter wind on the snowy cliffs, can't you? And then how about the bottom right of uh, Batman and the way the cape uh, drapes over the back of his body? Again, just made the cape the star of the show. And how about, again, another thumbnail I keep saying this, folks, to remind you, that's a quarter of the size of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And yet look at the fidelity to the final. How about this sketch? If you're already a bat aficionado, you know where this drawing comes from. It was the very next issue in the summer of 1972. One of Neil's greatest covers, although how many have I said that about? But yes, this is one of his most beloved covers. People went nuts over Batman's hairy chest. And you can see once again, it was all there in the thumbnail. He moved around some elements, but you can see the Ra's al Ghul figure. Neil would return. By the way, let me just point out the beautiful coloring, especially the background. Neil pushed the DC coloring department to get tones with their colors that they usually did not employ. But that's why Neil returned to it decades later. You can tell by the logo, this had to be in the early 2000s. More recently, Neil did this switch around with the Joker. And then a couple of years ago, they did the series called One Minute Later, where they got artists to interpret some of their greatest DC covers in terms of what would happen a minute later. So yeah, Batman rising much to Ra's al Ghul's chagrin, but you know, it's still the beautiful original that we all know and love. And it's one of the great, uh, I know I keep saying this. It's one of the great Neil Adams, Batman stories. It's, it's the epic showdown with Ra's al Ghul in the desert with his daughter, Talia, the Batman love interest at the time. Look at how, once again, Neil's thumbnail sketch. Once again, this is a case where I think I like the face and the sketch better than the Dick Giordano inked finish. But, you know, your mileage may vary. But how about the race head in the upper left panel and the great lighting as they square off in the desert? Now, if you know your Batman animated series, you know that they did a great adaptation of this episode. It's one of the great episodes of the great series, but totally based on this incredible story. Batman gets bit by a scorpion in the middle of the fight, and Raish leaves him to die in the desert. And then when we turn the page... One of my favorite Neo figures, it's a metaphor for him resurrecting Batman himself. The knowledge of anatomy with dramatic lighting is just awesome. The animated series did its best to show you the bare chest of Batman. It couldn't show the detail of the hairy chest, but ah, in two dimensions, Neil gives us one of his greatest. 
I mean, you feel the anger, the intensity in Batman ripping. Remember, folks, this is a two-dimensional flat plane. But tell me you don't feel that tent being literally ripped open. And then, of course, we pan over to see the expression on Raisha's face. Are you man or fiend from hell? Now, this incredible, you talk about tension and release. There's your tension. And when you turn the page, there's the release. Neil's mastery of anatomy and of cartooning doesn't even have to show you the punch. Now, Neil's opposite number, Jack Kirby, showed you the punch. He showed you characters being knocked off of the page. Kirby's art was taking elements from the comic page and blowing them off the page, whereas Neil Adams brought you into the page by not showing you the punch, yet you feel it by his mastery of anatomy and all of those force lines, shock lines, speed lines, whatever you want to call them. Now, how can Neil possibly top this panel? Well, how about with this? Remember I showed you? He, he showed us the bat and Batman as much as he showed us the man. What was revelatory about a scene like this of Batman's raw sexuality was this is what we were used to in 1966, you know, six years earlier during the Batman TV show era. This was the best they could do of Batman having a little sexuality, please. But that's what made this image so stunning. And here, once again, folks, for your amusement, edification, and enlightenment is Neil's single 8.5 by 11 page of thumbnails of the preceding four pages that I just showed you. So watch as I bring you through the magic of Apple Kino, how closely his thumbnails echo the final art. Once again, folks, we have no record of Neil's tight pencils nor the black and white inks. But man, these thumbnails are just magnificent because you can see how important they are for Neil Adams to establish the final drawing. Let's go down to the bottom left of the page. There's that great Batman rising out of the sand. I did my best to kind of position the comic pages, even though, again, Neil would move around the elements when he brought the page to finish. So I think in this case, I matched up. Look at the kissing figures and look at how closely they echo in the final art. And that's how the animated series ended too. Now you want an intense Batman face. How about this one? Penciled and inked by Neil. Now here's a static figure clutching a newspaper but Neil's mastery of anatomy, of tension, of lighting, you can feel the tension in Batman's still pose just in the pure drawing, inking, and lighting alone. Now, this story appearing in the summer of 72, the credits read that it's inked by Dick Giordano as you can see down below there. But I think he only inked the splash page. Either he got sick, I don't know what the story was, but the rest of this issue is inked by Neil. It's only the third solo Batman story that Neil inked after those initial eight brave and bolds of 68, 69. How about these top two panels? I wish I had a higher resolution of the black and white inked art to show you just Neil's mastery of inking, of black and white shading, of lighting, of everything that goes into making these figures stand out like they do. 
Ah, in addition to the once again realistic fighting action of the top three panels, this page is all about my single favorite Neil Adams Batman bus shot, headshot, whatever you want to call it. This, to me, coming at the end of his initial Batman career in 1972, was the culmination of what he had been striving for to bring Batman back to his earliest conception. This is the house ad from 1939. And I'm sorry, folks, but you can have all the live action Batman you want. In this piece I found on the internet, there's every live action cowl from the serials in the upper left of the 1940s, the TV show, and all the movies since. But you can have them. I'll take Neil Adams. How about this little sequence of heads in this particular issue? Just beautiful examples of penciling, inking, lighting, shading. I love Batman coming out of the trunk of the car from behind. There's another example of knowing how to draw the figure draped by material and how you can feel Batman, the way his arm is poised on the hood, the way the muscles flex. And then you have the stylization of Batman leaping in the next panel. Here's another case of Neil Adams understanding physics you can feel the weight of Batman lifting up the bad guy in the left panel. And through the torque of his figure, a Batman's figure, and the use of, again, motion lines, you, again, like film on paper, you can see that and feel that in your mind. And then the final page with that great Batman figure on top, with the stylized cape and the final all black cowl, except for the eyebrows. Well, that was the summer of 72. We would have to wait a whole year until the summer of 73 when the rumor mill circulated that Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill would be bringing back the Joker who hadn't been seen in Batman since 1969, not drawn by Neil. Um, but yeah, you can see in this classic what, be, what has become an icon. I'm going to show you in a little while. But I think Neil was thinking of the classic Jerry Robinson 1944 cover of a giant Joker looming over Batman. So Neil does his updated version of the giant Joker looming over, looks like Park Avenue South, if you know your New York City geography. But boy, has this cover become an icon. There's so many versions. I'm choosing to only show you some of my favorite. But yeah, I, I love this kind of very three-dimensional version. Speaking of three-dimensional version, there's another. That's not me in the photograph. I don't know who that is, some fan. But there's another Shoji screen that you can get. Just hunt on the internet, Batman Shoji screen. I'm sure you'll find it. Batman Beyond takes the classic cover and kind of does its own take on it now why am i showing you underground cartoonist joe matt whose style has nothing to do with neil adams and yet he wrote such a heartfelt eulogy after neil passed away i posted it on my facebook group neil adams almanac but he posted the drawing he did when he was 10 years old or some yeah somewhere around there of how much that cover impacted him as a young artist. Neil got to revisit the cover for the Joker book of a few years ago, where he turns the tables. But once again, give me the original. And it's this version of the Joker portraying him as a homicidal maniac that without a doubt is the model of the current Joker of the last well, ever since Neil's Joker, any modern cinematic version of the Joker is doing their take drawn from this one Joker story 
1973. It's all about the Joker returning after being in prison for years to murder his former gang members who betrayed him. Now, why am I showing you this interesting two pages about Batman meeting up with one of the Joker's goons? Now he's an older, retired boxer, Packy White. I love the first two panels in the upper left, Batman gliding in through the window. Uh, just a beautiful drawing where you can feel his figure sliding through the window. But I'm showing you this great sequence to once again enthrall you with Neil's thumbnails, a half page of an 8 amp by 11 piece of paper. Man, does this guy know how to draw? I think so. And just look at how so much of that thumbnail is in the finish. That you might think I'm showing you this beautiful page, maybe because of the beautiful figure in the center of Batman. Or how about the bottom left, Batman with the cape, like two bat wings. While they're really good, it's this drawing at the top right. My single favorite drawing of the Joker lurking in the background, about to murder his poor young ex-gang member the following page we get this great close-up in the bottom right and a nice close-up in the center of neil's joker cartoony yet realistic but man i'll still take this version on the next page it's another incredible Batman close-up. Boy, there's the Batmobile again. But man, look at the beautiful drawing, the lighting, the inking. Ah. Again, Neil's greatness, you can just wax poetic for a while on some of the gorgiosity of these images. Nobody's ever drawn Batman better. How about this page where Adams decides to use a photograph for the church and make a halftone Velox of it and then use Zipatone to shade Batman's face in this incredible panel. And Neil inked this story and you can tell in the quality and intricacy of the cross hatching. God bless Dick Giordano, but he never did the fine line cross hatching that Neil did on his own inking. I asked Neil when I worked for him, why did you choose to ink only a handful of stories? I know you were the, the most in-demand artist in comics. And, you know, you couldn't ink everything. He goes, Arlen, I chose to ink the stories that I thought were special. Well, this has proven to be in the 50 years since the most special Joker story and maybe the most special Batman Neil Adams story because it's so beloved because of the Joker. Comparing his teeth to shark teeth. Yeah, the Batman animated series did a great version of this. Check it out. And then you get one of Neil's single most iconic Batman full pages. The classic running pose. First of all, while you take in the beauty of the original printing, this has been reprinted and recolored so many times, but as I tell people, stick with the newsprint originals. Neil colored this, and when you look at the sensitivity of the way he colored the beach sand foreground, ground, the subtle green, the subtle browns, the beautiful zip tone and the blues in the background, I mean, man... This image has been co-opted for licensing usage ever since. You can get the jigsaw puzzle in a round can with the same art. How about this? God bless the internet. That's where I find a lot of these. Even Denny O'Neill, for his book on writing comics, used Neil's running Batman. And then there's this oddity. What is this, pray tell? Is this... The actual page, rip, what, what am I looking at? 
Folks, what you're looking at is a photorealist painter who was obviously in love with that image. But yes, that is a painting of what looks like the actual comic page torn out and taped the way it's taped. But that just shows you the many layered greatness of this particular running pose image, which was so popular that even back in the day, a year or two later, DC would have Neil Adams redo the running pose image for this treasury size tabloid edition, which based on a lot of Facebook posts was many Batman and Neil Adams fans first, depending on their age, this was their introduction to the Neil Adams Batman. But you can see how DC Comics <coughs> used that pose officially. This is from 1975. That's a Kurt Swan Superman on the left. Recently on the internet, I've seen it used this way. And how about the Japanese version? I'm assuming this is Japanese, but maybe it's Korean. I don't know. But yeah, it all comes back to that great cover. Now, this either came out in 1974 or 75, I think 75, but in this cover dated March 74, you have one of Neil's greatest Batman covers, in spite of all the trade dress interfering with it, it is an iconic Batman pose and beautiful drawing. Now, that was March of 74, 75, but this is definitely 1974. Neil's last Batman story of the era, Moon of the Wolf. How about that beautiful drawing in its black and white original form? And the finish. Now, I know you bad aficionados out there saying, Arlen, that wasn't the real cover. I know it was this. Do you believe it, folks? They turned Batman into one of these annual editions and Neil's beautiful Batman art was reduced to a small rectangle and that's Nick Cardi's vignettes on the right. Uh, well, the story written by Len Wein, who passed away a few years ago, but his partner, Marv Wolfman, they did that Simpson story. So here's Len Wein hooking up with Neil in late 73, early 74, for what would be Neil's last Batman story, dealing with a werewolf, one of Neil's favorite. Um, he loves werewolves. So you can see there's a beautiful woman getting undressed and a werewolf climbing up and obviously wants to go in the window where he does. And he confronts the woman, grabs her, and moves with a vengeance. Good God, he's thrown her out. There's nothing to break her fall except me. Ah, the physics of Batman jumping out the window. You can feel it. You can feel the fall through, once again, Neil's mastery of realistic anatomy, physics, and the use of comic book force lines. You can feel the torque of the Batarang because Neil knows how objects move in space. And then you get this page. Now, folks, just study this for a while. Notice what Neil is asking you, the viewer, to do. He wants you to follow Batman and the rope. Notice the beauty of the rope in its strobe form on the left top there, because that's the way the rope would break into the fall. And then your eye goes down to the bottom of the page, but then Neil is asking you to go up through the two center panels and wind up on the rooftop of the adjoining building. Uh, once again, you could teach a class in the construction of this page. But how about that close up? You've got to know how to draw the human face if you're going to draw a guy putting his tongue, you know, behind his upper lip while he's thinking. One of the great Neil Batman close-ups. It probably affected the great English artist Brian Boland about 10 years ago in the series Batman Black and White. He draws this incredible close-up. And Brian Boland, if you know anything about him, major Neil Adams fan, he did his college thesis paper 
I posted it in Neil Adams' almanac. But I've got to believe he was paying homage to Neil's Batman close up there. I'm choosing to show you this page. It's a, it's a simple storytelling page. But this just shows you the mastery of Neil with Batman. And it's black and white form. Just squint your eyes and notice the distribution of black ink and how Neil balances the page out. Look at the beautiful Commissioner Gordon figure on the bottom left. The lighting in the upper right of the top two panels. And then the close-up in the bottom, putting Batman totally in shadow with just rim lighting. I don't know if Neil colored this issue. But man, this is just, and the panel layout, simple, clear, and just beautiful, beautiful drawing. Moon of the wolf, indeed. You don't even need a wolf if you've got the moon and the great Neil Adams Batman head. Also adapted into the animated series, so check it out. But yes, by this time, Neil moved out of commercial comics and into doing um, commercial art pretty much the rest of his career. He would return to comics decades later. But in the 1970s, after he stopped drawing Batman regularly or semi-regularly, the only times he would draw Batman would be at comic conventions where he would do sketches. Now, look at the sketch he's drawing. That's this particular sketch right here, Batman and Dead Man. This was done in 1972 for the Detroit Triple Fanfare comic convention of, Bat of Neil's greatest um, DC characters, along with Star Trek's Enterprise thrown in for good measure. But how about this poster based on one of his convention sketches of Neil's famous uh, DC characters? In my Adam's Eclectica lecture in a few weeks, I'll be showing you some of his Spectre work uh, that I could devote a whole webinar to. But yeah, there's Batman at the top. And how about this Batman? Beautiful color. Now, I don't know whether the color was added to this later. You know, I find a lot of these things on the internet. I, I don't know for sure, but fun to show you the color version because we got plenty of beautiful black and white sketches. I wish I knew the exact years. I just know from Neil's signature that these were in the 1970s. But Lucky Ed and Lucky Robert, right? When I saw this image, and then decades later, the great Bill Sienkiewicz would do this full-color Batman. If you know anything about Bill Sienkiewicz, he started out as the ultimate Neil Adams clone and then became the great multimedia artist you see now. But you can still sense his origins in Neil's art, especially with this figure, I feel echoed by Neil's great Batman sketch figure. Batman kneeling. Batman sitting in the palm of Talia's hand. And Batman laying down. It's not a sketch. This looks like a tighter finished ink drawing. It looks like, uh, dare I say, after the fact. But how about this incredible sketch? Now, if you're a bat aficionado and a Neil aficionado, you know where this comes from. Let me just move it to the lower right here and dissolve to what was a wraparound treasury edition reprint of the entire Rachel Ghoul series of stories. Released circa 1975, I believe. Neil does a mezzotint background and homage to the original and beautiful. How about this pencil drawing that I think was inked by Giordano? and became this full color piece. 
Now, this looks like it was the cover to the book that came with, remember I showed you some power record book collections? You know, these came out in the mid-70s, mid to late 70s. I never saw them. I never saw them advertised. I would have bought these just for the Neil Adams artwork alone. This Batman running sketch dated 1974. Looks like it might have been a prelim for this finished piece of Batman advertising art. And a lot of the inking looks like Giordano. I wish I had a higher resolution of this great image. Again, anytime Neil would draw Batman, it was a treat, if it, even if it wasn't the greatest piece of, of total art. But if you were starved for Neil Adams' Batman in the 70s, this is all that we had to placate us. Batman meeting Sherlock Holmes? Batman meeting Dracula? You know, I don't know what this was. Was this a... A, a proposal for a Batman Dracula, because Bat Neil loves Dracula. When I talk about his Marvel works in two weeks, he did a lot of Dracula art at Marvel, but I never found out the reason of what this, uh, maybe this was Neil's proposal, that DC do a Batman Dracula, I'm not sure. A little piece of advertising art for the 70s, 1977, I think. There's Neil's Batman in the background. How about the Super DC calendar of 1976? Batman and Robin with the gargoyle. I think this Batman pinup was from one of those treasury editions that I showed you, circa 74, 75. I think this Batman pinup is from the 80s, maybe. I don't think it's from the 90s, but it may be. I'm not sure the exact date. But man, that's some cape, huh? This is more recent from the 21st century. And that's a scene down below recreated from Secret of the Waiting Graves, his first Batman story of Denny O'Neill that I showed you at the top of the webinar. You can see how Neil redid the panel, remember from the Joker story into, and he would take commissions for finished pieces like this. This 70s sketch, dated 71, beautiful. He would later turn around and finish in the early 2000s for the first of three hardcover collections that DC would put out called Batman Illustrated by Neil Adams. This sketch, I'm not sure when this dates from, but it's either based on the same thing he did for the second volume and volume three is yet another take on the running figure that Neil did. And that has been repackaged multiple times. The definitive Batman artist of the 70s. Yeah, I'd say so. Neil would lend his art in these past two decades of the 21st century to <coughs> publications like the Batcave Companion, and the first issue in 1998 of Comic Book Artist Magazine. Now it's called Comic Creator. Uh, I actually designed the logo for this publication. And you can see that they got Neil to take this old... Now, I think this is an old sketch from the 70s that Neil never did anything. Maybe it was a proposal. And that's Neil finishing it off. There's the master making a Batman sketch from recent years and why is batman gripping his arm dripping with blood well right around the time he did this sketch he also did not sketch finished drawing there was this of batman in your face getting hit by bullets going right through his arm well that would become the cover to neil's comeback to drawing comic books full-time after 36 years of doing primarily storyboards and comps and animatics. Um, he both wrote and drew a, I think it was a 12-part series starting in 2010 when uh, he was, I think, uh, let's see, 
59 years old, about to turn 60? No, about to turn 69 years old, about to turn 70, right? Am I getting that right? I, I'm, all, I'm all mixed up. But yeah, it's, it's really Neil putting his heart into the ultimate Batman tale. And you can tell that even at such a later age, Neil's mastery of drawing in double page spreads like this was still at a top level. You know, when they talk about Tom Brady at his advanced age, still playing at a high level, that's Neil's drawing ability. So, you could, you know, it was Batman Odyssey on land, uh, under the sea, and in the air. And there's Neil's latest Batmobile version of the car that he designed in 1970. And there's his take on a modern Robin. Don't forget that it was Neil, I think in the late 90s, who designed the modern Robin outfit that now everybody uses. Here's a modern take on the Batman Robin meetup after Robin's parents get killed, trapeze artists. And when you look at that drawing of the all black cowl, I loved it when in his later years, Neil was a little more stylized like this. You know, if you didn't know that was Neil's signature, you might not guess this was Neil Adam, but I kind of wish he did more finished art that looked like this. But Neil owned the Batman visage. He owned the Batman head. He did multiple commissions that only he could do. Only Neil Adams could draw Batman the way many fans like myself believe he should look. And there he is in these last years, still drawing the definitive Batman. I think the best sketch to end this webinar on is maybe this commission drawing of Neil's Batman meeting up with basically his bet noir, his opposite number. What I started out this webinar with is how Neil rescued Batman from the campiness of the TV show. But in the end, Neil makes peace with his past. And not only is Batman saying we are the greatest, but indirectly it's saying that Neil Adams is the greatest Batman artist of all time. So folks, this has been the third of my seven proposed webinars, memorial webinars in the wake of Neil's passing. Next week, same bat time, well, not bat time, but same time, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll be doing his great Green Lantern, Green Arrow series, the greatest Green Lantern, Green Arrow of all, because so many have done them since then. But all the information for my webinars and events are on the events blog page of my website, which you can see if you go to it, has different pages. The comic book history page has information about my book. You can get assigned and sketched in by me, hardcover copy. It's the only book of its kind that's about the art. And I even take out the original dialogue and narration and put the artist talking about the art. I run a group based on the book on the Silver Age, as well as one on Jack Kirby. And of course, I run one on Neil Adams, Neil Adams' almanac. He influenced my own illustration style the most, doing comic art, but for the advertising and editorial markets. And one of my specialties is turning real people into superheroes, but keeping the photographic likeness. My website's linked to the commercial site, TeePublic, where you can get over 125 of my illustrations in every knickknack, knockoff, gigaw, thigamabob, and application you could think of. So support your local freelance artist. If you go to the uh, visual lectures and webinars page, oh, I'm sorry, I've got these pages out of order. My visual lectures and webinars page is all about, I used to call what I did live visual lectures, but since the pandemic, webinars. But those are images from both my YouTube channel that is here, 
that has videos of all my recent webinars. And then if I jump ahead, my YouTube channel has all the videos that have copyrighted content that the YouTube lawyers are more uh, uh, aware of and they don't allow your videos, but it seems like Vimeo is more lax. So you can see a lot of my copyrighted content, Bruce Springsteen, James Bond, Twilight Zone, and many more are on my Vimeo channel. So folks, I hope to see you next week for the greatest Green Lantern Green Hour of all. And I wanna thank you for being here and I look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. Thanks for attending this presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. And please remember to click the subscribe or follow button on your platform screen to be notified of all of my upcoming pop culture presentations. And visit my website, arlenschumer.com, to sign up for my newsletter, too. Until next time, I'm Arlen Schumer. Bye-bye.